Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Counter Apologist Quick Counters. Uh, today, Cameron Bertuzzi of Capturing Christianity put forward a video with a Dr. Chad McIntosh uh, that is why atheism logically leads to despair, <laughs> right? And I mean, with a title like that, I, I, I was just staggered and was like, they're really going to go for this? Uh, now, he did have a, a very interesting spin on this argument. Uh, normally, you're used to the whole, uh, what he addresses in the video at the beginning, he calls it uh, pessimism, right? So this is very theistic friendly, He's put out by apologists like William Lane Craig and Craig Keener and a variety of others. Basically, the idea that um, if you, everyone just dies at the end of their life, there's no uh, eternal, uh, no eternal life, what he calls um, uh, cessationism about life, uh, that there is no meaning, right? That what's the point if, if everything uh, goes away, and so uh, you have to have eternal life, and Craig will argue God as well to have meaning, uh, or objective, or ultimate meaning, which is its own special form of a problem. We'll get to that later. Anyway, uh, so that's the classic argument. Uh, they're going to go a different way, but this argument, I, it just struck me as so bad, and I don't want to bag on, on Dr. McIntosh here. Uh, it's the first time I've seen him. He seems quite agreeable. I actually like some of the things he says, but this argument strikes me as very poor. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, and I, I just want to start off, they're, they're not talking about pessimism, but uh, interestingly, Cameron says that he endorses the pessimistic view. We're just going to do a couple quick clips. We're going to swap back and forth here. So here we go. With the pessimistic look of death, cessationism. And so I, I've been like, but then I'm... So, uh, you know, he's just saying yeah, cessationism leads to, to pessimism of sorts. Um and, and really what I want um, Dr. McIntosh to, to kind of go through here, I'm going to put it up to 1.5 play speed. Um, he describes what he calls the optimistic outlook. And I actually found his description to be pretty good. So I'm going to let this go. It's at 1.5 speed. Sorry for the speed up, guys, but I don't, I don't want to be taking up too much time. So let him, he charitably describes an atheist uh, view of meaning. Here we go. <clears throat> the, the other reaction other than pessimism is, is just what I'm calling optimism. Um, they think that death magnifies our sense of meaning in life. You know, this is the idea behind, you know, we, we used to say carpe diem, Latin for seize the day, right? Well, now that's been replaced by uh, YOLO, right? You only live once. Uh, so this is, a more, this is a more common view expressed by atheists today, I think. But, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's not peculiar to atheists today. Uh, I mean, this is also what's behind King Solomon's, you know, saying, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, but, but anyway, a nice statement of optimism today comes from philosopher Simon Blackburn, atheist philosopher. Now, he doesn't bemoan the fact that there's no objective meaning of life. Okay, so objective meaning, lols. What does objective mean, right? If you go listen to Dr. Craig, he talks about objective means uh, ind uh, mind independence. How is anything that is related to meaning not being a function of mind? The idea of objective meaning is just literally a self-contradiction. Sorry, we're going to go back to the video. Life. Uh, he, said, uh, he says this. He says, instead, there's another option for meaning. Uh, end quote, which is to look only within life itself. It is content with the everyday. There is sufficient meaning for human beings in the human world, the world of the familiar, and even the humdrum doings and experiences. The smile of the baby, the grace of a dancer, the sound of voices, the movement of a lover give meaning to life. For some, it is activity and achievement, gaining the summit of a mountain, crossing the finish line, finding the cure, or writing a poem. These things last only for a short time, but that does not deny them meaning. A smile does not need to go on forever to, have to mean what it does. There is no such thing as the meaning of life, but there can be many meanings within a life. Okay, so actually kind of like uh, this, this outlook here. Um, as a matter of fact, what I found particularly interesting about Dr. McIntosh here is that he actually endorses this view. So here we go again. But as it stands, as we've articulated the views, I think the optimists are actually closer to the truth. Contra, Craig, and Kreeft, and, and, and even Schopenhauer and, and Tolstoy. Uh, I think death does make life more meaningful, not less. Death is a great reason, perhaps the greatest reason, for making the most of the time that we have, which is all the more precious on account of its scarcity. Uh, so, so again, Solomon was right. If tomorrow we die, we should eat, drink, and be merry uh, and make the most of, of life uh, right now. Uh, all right, so very important thing that he said there. Death makes life more meaningful, right? That's, that's an important, I mean, I agree with him, but it's a very important admission. Uh, put a bookmark in it. It's going to come back later. So... Here, uh, Dr. McIntosh gives an example of 
uh, now once we've accepted optimism and we've access, accepted cessationism, the fact that we simply cease to exist when we die, um, what should we do? We want to maximize our meaning. And he gives a very entertaining example here, so I'm just going to let him, let him, let him give it. Yeah, so I want to put, <laughs> put more flesh on the bones of, of this idea of maximizing meaning. And, and, and it's a pretty simple idea, but uh, I mean, think, you think that uh, most of the activities we pursue, or at least those we voluntarily pursue, are things that we think will bring meaning to our lives, uh, directly or indirectly. So when it's up to us, we choose what we think is going to be more satisfying and fulfilling over what we think is going to be less satisfying and fulfilling. Uh, I mean, it's almost trivial. It hardly needs stated, but, but let's, let's kind of work up to it. Uh, so if you were offered uh, a choice between a Butterfinger candy bar and a Milky Way candy bar, uh, and you like Butterfingers more than Milky Ways, and you should, by the way, uh, yeah. it would be odd, perhaps even irrational, to choose the Milky Way over the Butterfinger, right? In general, we choose what we think will maximize meaning in our lives, satisfaction, fulfillment, and so forth. Okay, so first and most important point, yes, Butterfinger over Milky Way. Um, but I think he's, he's, he's making a decent point. We, try, we want to maximize our meaning in terms of like we, we want to do things that basically what we value effectively. Uh, it's a fine point. Um, you might be able to start telling where he's going to go with this. Uh, and I want to um, – here he presents the problem or what he thinks is the problem with maximizing meaning uh, when you believe that life ends at death and there's no afterlife. Uh, here we go. Does this lead to despair? Yeah, how, how can I be sure that what I'm doing at any moment is in fact maximizing meaning? Because it seems like for anything I do, it seems like the pestering thought would remain. Isn't there something else I could be doing that would be more satisfying and fulfilling? Uh, I mean, just ask yourself, Cameron, isn't there something else right now that you could be doing other than interviewing me that would be more satisfying and fulfilling? <laughs> Don't answer Possibly. that question. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the, 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 hmm. the listeners can ask themselves the same question. Is it, surely there's something else that they could be doing that would be more satisfying and fulfilling than, than watching Instead this. Instead of interview. watching Capturing Christianity. <laughs> right. right. So, um, yeah, probably should be doing something other than watching Capturing Christianity. Um, that said, uh, I want to get to sort of the question that, that, that he brings up here um, of, you know, the fact, the the problem he thinks is that given atheism and this maximizing our uh, maximizing our meaning, uh, this makes life too meaningful. So here we go. Is the end? But well, but even then, you'd still always be faced with this question of whether or not you're, what you're doing is is the best way to maximize meaning. Backpacking across Europe or whatever. Uh, is there anything you can be sure is worth your while if this life is all you have? So I guess the main idea is that not knowing for sure what maximizes meaning itself sort of gnaws away at meaning. It's, it's, it's as if, if cessationism is true, life becomes too meaningful. The worth of my life as a receptacle for meaning exceeds the while I have to maximize, the time I have to maximize. Uh, so it, it's, it's each moment of my life is so pregnant with, with potential for more meaning that I despair at the likelihood that I'm failing to maximize. Uh, okay, so this just seems so outlandish right he makes another point where he says you can't spend even too much time worrying about maximizing your meaning because that's time you're not maximizing your meaning um and it's this really weird like oh we should be uh so so worried that we we don't know what will actually maximize our meaning and so we have to be very careful to you know we, 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 we since we can't know what it is we don't actually know what to do Right. And then we're stuck. Like if you, the more you think about it, the more time you're wasting. And so this leads to existential despair <laughs> for some reason. And I just I, I don't get it. Um, like to say that, I, you know, I don't know, like like I don't know what it could possibly make me the happiest. He even brings up that, like, even if there actually was something that would be the most uh, maximizing meaning action you could take at any given time, you wouldn't be able to know it. It's epistemically unreachable. Um, and so you still don't escape the despair. I'm sorry. Uh, so like we, one of the things you might think about, um, like from reading like the original, uh, the, the Greek philosophers, you talk of eudaimonia, a life well lived or living a good life. And one of the things I know even I've had to do, I mean, even fairly recently was I had some conflicts in things that I valued, uh, between things that I valued, right? And I kind of had to really sit down and think to myself, which of these things that I value that are in conflict do I need to pursue? 
what's the most valuable thing in life to me? And yes, then I will act accordingly. Now, um, ultimately for me, that's like my family, right? My wife, my kids, um, trying to raise my kids to be good people, trying to be a good husband to my wife, trying to be happy, being with my friends, mixing with hobby and professional goals and everything else. But it's not, you know, it's a balancing game. And I, I, I have constraints on my time. And so like worrying about, am I not maximizing it all, um, actually just seems kind of crazy. Like I, I know that it's going to end. I know that the ending actually makes my life more meaningful. I actually agree with his original premise there that, you know, without death, like life just keeps going on and on. Why do I even get, why do I bother to do anything? This is one of the problems I have even with eternal life in heaven, like if, if universalism were true, I'm not 100% sure it's perfect, or at least maybe God has to like change me or something to make me think it's perfect. Um, so I, I definitely think death gives my limited time more meaning, but at the same time, I, I acknowledge my limitations and I, I figure out through introspection, what is the good life for me? I give myself the meaning and I pursue that. Uh, optimizing it to the point of having existential despair are you crazy you know that like that defeats the purpose of of maximizing my meaning <laughs> it's like it's almost like a self-defeating argument um so and, and speaking of self-defeating i want to switch to uh, his solution that he proposes so let's let's listen in here um because you know if, if you believe that there's an afterlife then you don't need to stress about whether you are at all times maximizing meaning in this life. It's much easier to just be content with, with meaning and moderation uh, if you believe that. You always have opportunity to make up for lost time. Okay. So, remember that bit about death making life more meaningful and more precious? Um, the solution, which he says is pretending that um, uh, cessationism is false so that he will always have infinite time to uh, maximize his meaning... Um, it just, you know, I, I don't, if you, if you give that up to somehow think that you're going to be okay to, you know, live in uh, meaning and moderation or getting meaning to a good enough level because you could go on for an infinite time, well, first of all, you're giving up the idea of cessationism, which makes things more meaningful. So you've gone back to an infinite amount of time. So things, your amount of time basically becomes meaningless because you have infinite time to get whatever meaning. Um, so, uh, you know, you're, you've given up the thing that makes the time valuable. So it, it seems like this is almost a self-defeating solution to the problem. Uh, you kind of get to turn the objection almost on its head. And I, I just don't see why, if you know, living with meaning and moderation um, is unachievable for the atheist. Like, uh, I just know that I can get... Uh, a good enough amount of meaning in my limited capacities and my limited capabilities. Why, if it's good enough for the theist to starve off the despair, why is it not good enough for me just on a limited timeline? And I still have the optimism that we talked about that makes my limited time meaningful. Um, now, he actually gets a question about this and he tries to uh, answer it. He says it is the most formidable objection. And I think he's right. It is probably the, the feeder for this argument. Uh, I don't think he does a good job handling it, though. He tries to address it. I'll give him that, give him that much. So here we go. This is the last clip we're going to play here. Um, I'm not convinced that satisficing isn't just a form of maximizing. Oh, so sorry. Satisficing is... Um, basically maximizing your meaning within constraints. So here we go. Uh, so that's kind of why I think I saw a contradiction there. Uh, satisficing is, is just maximizing given certain constraints, constraints of time and, and resources. So uh, where, where going beyond those constraints would incur costs that outweigh the benefits. So um, this, this can have the appearance of good enough, but what good enough means in these contexts is just the best given my constraints. Satisficing, to me, it seems to me that satisficing is just, a maximi is just maximizing on a budget. Uh, so if you're a cessationist, uh, you're still going to, to choose what you think maximizes meaning given the constraints you have on your choices. Uh, and so what I'm suggesting is the best choice here is to, is to deny cessationism and live as though there, there's an afterlife. All right, so that conclusion doesn't follow, right? So why would I deny cessationism and live as if there's an afterlife if I'm saying I'm just, if, I'm, if, if, if satisficing or maximizing my happiness given constraints 
um, means that I just acknowledge that I, I, I get to a good enough level of meaning, isn't that just the answer? It just stops there. I, I'm good enough. I know I can't achieve perfection. Life is not perfect. I grant this readily. This doesn't cause existential despair. I'm able to live the best life I can, and that's it. I don't, I don't have to deny that I'm going to just cease to exist when I die. Like, I don't see how that's a problem. Like, it doesn't follow that I have to give this up. Uh, now, there's one more thing I want to bring up, uh, besides refuting the argument, was a bit of Cameron kind of uh, contradicting himself, really. Uh, this was retweeted by Spartan Theology here. Um, so this was uh, not too long ago. Ben, ben Watkins, uh, who I worked with on the Real Atheology podcast, go check them out. I'm no longer a member of the cast, but they do an amazing job. Um, however, um, he points out something about cessationism, uh, which you know, Cameron doesn't really like. He's a pessimist. He doesn't like the optimism. Uh, he says, you know, you're going to die. Act like it, which is, you know, hey, live your life, maximize your meaning. Um, and Cameron's like, hey, you should remove this tweet, especially for those who are experiencing depression, right? Because like, oh, don't, don't talk about death and, and, you know, the fact that you're going to die because it, it might upset people uh, who, are, who are depressed. Um, which then Cameron posts this video of <laughs> why uh, cessationism uh, leads to despair. So like, it, do, does the depression only really affect, like, we only need to worry about, uh, you know, like, 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 is, oh, if you're a Christian, well, the depression doesn't matter because you're going to go live forever. Like, like, where's your, how, how could you possibly reconcile these two statements and tweets? It's just ridiculous to me. Uh, it's, uh, frankly, he's contradicting himself, just like I think the actual argument contradicts itself. So uh, that's all for this one. I uh, hope you appreciate it. Uh, get some meaning out of all this. And uh, thanks for watching.